The presentation I gave uh, just a little bit ago actually was, uh, I think it's called multifaceted impedance issues. And the reason I said that is because it's not just a simple uh, impedance from a single ended transmission line. It's actually many different issues that I've ran into. And, and what I was really trying to do is uh, trying to share my learning curve more than anything else. And there are several different issues. One of them be copper surface roughness. Uh, that's actually the copper surface roughness as we make the laminate. So the copper substrate interface, that roughness, that's actually what's really pretty important. But what's interesting is it's very important uh, in regards to how the circuit performs for phase response, uh, insertion loss, things like that. But it doesn't make as big importance, uh, big difference as impedance uh, on impedance. And that's one thing that's kind of uh, baffled some of our designers is that they know the copper surface roughness does cause difference in insertion loss and phase response, but they assume that it would make a difference in impedance, but they don't see that. After going through the reason why and models and things like that, and actually have tested this on circuits, the main reason why the copper surface roughness really doesn't affect impedance that much is because uh, it's actually affecting the phase response of the circuit, so the circuit perceives a different dielectric constant. And dielectric constant is actually a lower uh, variable. It's not as dominant as other things for impedance. So for what it, my presentation was trying to explain was uh, there's four main variables for impedance. Uh, the thickness of the substrate, copper thickness, dielectric constant variation, and the copper thickness. And it turns out the dielectric constant variation is the least of the variables for impedance. There's other things that uh, get more involved, like some of the phase response issues that we deal with for automotive uh, sensors. That can be a lot more uh, interesting. Uh, but anyway, copper surface roughness, I talked a fair amount, mainly because uh, a lot of the designers that know the RF side of it, they think it's a really big deal, and it is, but it doesn't impact impedance as much as what other people have thought. So that was one topic. Uh, another topic with impedance was looking at different structures like microstrip versus uh, coplanar versus strip line. So I looked at all those different structures and looked at some anomalies there. And I really don't have time to go into detail here, but I've given some formulas about how you can actually model them a little more accurately. So I think that's a pretty quick overview of what I presented earlier. It's about an hour long presentation, but quite a list actually. And some of it's dependent on the application. And just for example, like a power amplifier application, Usually thermal management's a big deal there because they're usually putting a lot of power through the circuit board, so they really need to understand thermal management. In that case, it could be looking at a material that has very high thermal conductivity. And also material that's low in losses because the low losses means you're going to generate less heat. If it's very good for thermal conductivity, then that means whatever heat is generated can migrate down to the uh, heat sink very effectively. So for power amplifiers, it's something that's uh, very thermal related. First thing that comes to mind normally is low loss and high thermal conductivity. Uh, we're also working a lot with uh, automotive sensors at 77 gigahertz. And some of the things that they look at are not actually thermal issues. It's uh, issues like uh, dielectric constant control. How tightly controlled is the dielectric constant of the substrate, but also how much the copper surface roughness varies that. So copper surface roughness actually has an impact on the phase response of the circuit, which ultimately means the circuit can behave as if the dielectric constant is different, not due to the substrate, but due to the roughness itself. So a rougher copper actually slows the uh, phase velocity, and a slower phase velocity translates to higher dielectric constant. So for a millimeter wave that's really sensitive, because uh, these are at 77 gigahertz, so it's really high frequency, very small wavelength. So they're very sensitive to the slightest anomaly. And in this case, dielectric constant control of the material itself is important, but also the copper surface roughness and how much it varies can be important. Uh, so it kind of depends on the application. Each application has their own area that's really important. Uh, moisture absorption is usually one of those topics that comes up a lot, uh, mainly because if you absorb moisture into the, the material, dielectric constant changes, the dissipation factor changes, uh, and then you also have reliability issues. If you absorb enough moisture and you solder it, then you can pop the circuit apart. Uh, and then there's also another issue that can be problematic that has got a lot of designers in trouble, and that's TCDK, that's thermal coefficient of dielectric constant. So all materials have this property, and basically what it is is the dielectric constant will change with a change in temperature. As you go up in temperature, dielectric constant is going to change. And what happens many times is the designers will design a, um, a, a new circuit, and they will fine-tune it in a lab environment. Then they put it out in the field, and it cycles through the environment in the field. And then the dielectric constant changes as the temperature changes. And this, if it's not well accounted for, it can be very, very problematic. So I guess I don't have a really quick answer for you, except that it kind of depends on the application. Some applications, we would lean heavily toward one aspect of material properties, and another application, a different one. We've actually announced uh, a couple of things. One is uh, a new material that we're using uh, for millimeter wave. And we've been having a lot of business, uh, a lot of new designs on uh, our R3003 materials at 77 gigahertz for automotive radar sensors. And uh, it is a PTFE-based material, 
So it has very good losses, but it's also more problematic for circuit fabrication. Being PTFE based, you just can't go through a standard permanganate uh, to get the plated through hole to, to uh, be reliable. So you normally have to do something different. That and other things. So really what the industry has been asking for is a materials that is uh, more like uh, the RL3003 for performance, for electrical performance, low loss, uh, consistent dielectric constant control, but also something that's easier to fabricate with. So what we did was we uh, we reformulated a RL4000 substrate to behave like the 3003 for insertion loss and phase response, dielectric constant control, and also very smooth copper. So that is our RO4830. So that's a new material we launched um, actually about a year ago. So it's been out on the market a little while and starting to gain traction. But it's really the need for the automotive sensors at 77 gigahertz to have a material that performs good electrically, but also is something that can be made into circuit form without a lot of trouble at the fabricator. Actually, the 4830 material should have minimal issues with that, just because it's, it's a thermal set. So it's not like, um, like the 3003, it's a PTFE-based material. And as you drought that, it is softer, it's, it's kind of stringy even. So you can get some fibers with that. With the 4830, it's a, a thermal set material, it's more rigid. So as you route through that, it's actually a much cleaner route. So you normally don't have problems with fibers and, and debris and things like that at the routed edge. But the biggest difference between the 3003 and the 4830 is we could not, we tried to match the properties exactly, we couldn't do it for a lot of reasons. But what we did was we matched the dielectric constant as close as we could. So it's a difference of 0.1 in dielectric constant between the 3003 and the 4830. 4830 is about 3.2 if you evaluate in circuit form. The 3003 is about 3.1 evaluated in circuit form. Uh, and then the insertion loss is just about the same. Uh, the 4830 has a little more insertion loss because it does have a little higher dissipation factor. But the, uh, the trade-off is even though the 4830 has higher dissipation factor, it's actually got smoother copper. And the smoother copper it yields less conductor losses, so you get better insertion loss. So if you look at insertion loss curves of 3003 versus 4830, which I do have, uh, you'll see that they're pretty close. The 4830 is a little more lossy at 77 gigahertz, but not a lot. And then the dielectric constant, like I said, there's a little difference, but it's uh, as close as we could get it and still keep all the properties that we wanted to keep. Right now, um, the 4830, as far as I know, uh, it's compatible with every prepreg we tried it with so far. So we tried um, 4450, one of our prepregs, and that, that works fine. We've actually tried FR4 prepregs because a lot of our materials are using hybrids. So it may be using Rogers materials and a lot of FR4 with it. That's fine. Uh, the FR4 prepregs that I've tried, I've never had a problem with. So it seems to be pretty compatible with other prepregs in the industry. We've also looked at uh, FEP and some other films that are uh, better for electrical performance, a little more problematic for actually lamination. Uh, but so far, I haven't found anything to be uh, not compatible with the 4830 for lamination for prepreg. I guess it's like anything. If you look at uh, certain applications, there's always a give and take. And certain Rogers materials uh, can have more issues with solder mask than others, and it depends. It depends on how the material is um, processed, it depends on the solder mask, it depends on a lot of things. One example would be like our 5880, which is almost a pure PTFE material. And of course, it's a Teflon based material, which means liquids won't want to adhere to it, and you're trying to put on a liquid photo imageable solder mask. And in some cases, we've had uh, some customers who actually scrub the surface thinking that if you mechanically scrub it, you add to the tooth and it's going to bond better. But in the case of uh, 5880, it's a very smooth, uh, very um, soft material. And if you look microscopically, after you etch off the copper, the surface has a bunch of peaks and valleys. And whenever someone tries to roughen that, they don't roughen it, they actually just smooth it over. And they actually polish it and then the solder mask doesn't bond as well. So it's just a bunch of little things like that. So most of our materials are pretty robust for solder masks to adhere to and perform well, but there's little tricks like that that you have to understand. I think most fabricators probably know that, but every now and then you run into that. There's also some tricks with uh, some materials that could absorb chemistry too, that if you absorb some chemistry and then seal it in with solder mask and then later solder, you could get blistering. So that has to be well understood too. So some materials after you go through some uh, wet process and you're gonna have to do a bake to drive off any uh, chemistry that could have been um, absorbed in the material and then apply the solder mask. So generally our materials are used with solder mask without much problem, but there are always little things that you have to be considered of course. So if it's a PTFE based material, that's a lot more problematic as I'm sure you're aware. If it's uh, like RO4000, it's not PTFE, it's a thermal set, that's pretty easy. You can go through permanganate or maybe a, a plasma cycle that's uh, CF4, nitrogen, oxygen, things like that. But the PTFE materials like RO3003, um, that's actually a little more forgiving for the plated through hole preparation process. It still needs to be uh, activated differently than like FR4 or something else. And normally um, what can be done in that, there's a plasma process that we found. If it's 100% helium and plasma, you can actually prep the hole wall very effectively that way, which is good because then you don't have 
some of the nasty chemistries that may be involved with other things. The materials that are more pure PTFE, like the 5880, it's almost a pure PTFE. That's where you really have to do the sodium naphthalene, or you actually have to strip a uh, fluorine item, uh, item to actually get the, uh, the, um, the chemistry to wet out well. So usually the more pure PTFE the substrate is, the more difficult the plated through hole prep is. If it's highly loaded, like 3003 is PTFE, but it's highly loaded with ceramic, uh, that's more forgiving. You can do this plasma process with 100% helium that works very well. Uh, again, something that's more pure PTFE, that's where it gets a little trickier. And usually you have to do uh, like a sodium etch or a, uh, something like that to actually prepare the wall for plating. If that's not done correctly, then of course you're going to get a whole wall pull away where the copper actually is not adhered to the whole wall, and that's a reliability issue. There's also another issue with this, and that is um, some of the PTFE materials, when they go through this uh, wet process, the sodium naphthalene process to prepare the through hole wall, the material actually can absorb the chemistry some. And if that absorbs in the chemistry, then you plate copper inside there, seal it in, then you go through soldering, then it blows apart all the, the vias. So that's a real problem. Uh, and it's actually a simple thing to fix, is after you've treated the material, you go through a bake cycle to basically drive off whatever is absorbed in the material, then go through electrolysis, copper plating, and then it's okay. But there's a lot of tricks like that. Uh, nothing that you can't get around, you just have to know the tricks.